Okay, hi there everyone. My name is Ben. I'm one of the careers advisors here at Angel Campus. Um, so we have a talk today on plant biotechnology and climate change. Uh, we've got two members of staff from Essex University. Um, I'll just introduce them to you now. Um, and then I'll leave you in their sort of capable hands. I think there'll be time for questions at the end. So we've got Yuli, who's here from the School of, of Life Sciences. Um, she's going to be leading on the, on the session. And we've also got Katie, who's from the outreach team as well. So do you just want to sort of introduce yourself, Yuli and Katie, yeah. and then we'll get started, OK? Yeah, sure. I mean, I have a little bit about myself in the talk anyway, in my career. OK, so um, so maybe Katie wants to introduce herself first and then I'll go straight into my talk. Yeah, of course. Yeah. Um, hi, everyone. Um, my name's Katie and uh, I work for the outreach team. So we look to deliver talks, resources, events for students in schools and sixth forms to provide information about higher education and hopefully help you as a student make um, help you to make easier decisions about what you want to do next. Um, so if you do have any questions just about university applications, student life or anything today, please feel free to ask at the end. Um, but obviously today is more about um, the talk um, that we're going to have now. So thank you. Thanks, Katie. OK, then over to me, I guess. Right, so my name is Ulrike or Uli uh, Bechtold, and I'm a senior lecturer in the School of Life Sciences, but I'm also the director of admissions. So I make actually all the decisions on uh, students that apply to study with us. Uh, but fundamentally, I'm a plant biologist <clears throat> and I do a lot of plant research in the department to do with plant biotechnology. And so the talk today is going to be about plants, but first about me. Uh, as you probably gathered from my name, um, I was not born in the UK. I was born in Germany and I grew up in the middle of literally nowhere. This is where I grew up. <clears throat> and so I basically was an outdoors child. I loved nature. And so I decided I wanted to study biology. Wasn't quite sure what I liked in biology and therefore I did a general biological sciences degree. Still in Germany, this is quite close to my hometown. So I basically commuted every day. Uh, didn't move away from home. <clears throat> and as you can tell, actually, I studied zoology, biochemistry, plant physiology, a little bit, and animal physiology. So my degree wasn't really dedicated to plant science. I hadn't really discovered plant science at that point at all. Um, was more into zoology, biochemistry, um, and that sort of thing. Well, then I figured out actually at university that science, I, I did science because I was really rubbish at languages. <clears throat> and I mean, really rubbish at languages. And then I kind of got to university and realized actually, if you do a science, you need to learn English. OK, you need to speak English. And, uh, you know, I did English in school for eight years and it, I failed miserably at it. So I decided, OK, I have to do something about this. And I chose to go on a year abroad as part of my degree. And I chose to go to Lancaster University up north. This is a campus university. It's very similar to Essex, actually, same age as Essex. Feels very similar to Essex. And actually a beautiful part of the UK. Fell in love with the UK, partly because of the Lake District. Again, still very much like to go outside in nature. Um, and I spent 10 months uh, in the Lancaster University. Uh, and I did my sort of research project there. And there is when my interest in plant science basically started. I joined a lab that worked on plant research and I had the best time of my life, I literally the best time of my life in that year. And I really enjoyed the science side of things as well. After the 10 months, um, I decided I was going to stay in the UK and I was looking then, so I finished my degree in Germany and I was looking for um, PhD positions. So these are uh, doctoral research positions. And I found one uh, at the John Innes Center, which is up the road uh, from Essex, actually. It's in East Anglia still. It's based in Norfolk, so in Norwich. And again, this is a basically dedicated plant and microbiology, microbiology research institute on the outskirts of Norwich. It's affiliated with the University of East Anglia, but it's basically standalone. So I spent about five years at the John Innes Center, then had a little stint in the Netherlands, uh, in Utrecht, uh, which was also really nice. And then I basically came to the University of Essex 
in the early 2000s, first as a researcher where I did you know, a lot of lab research for professors at the university. And then I became an academic member of staff, a lecturer, and now I'm a senior lecturer at the university. I have my own research group. Um, I obviously teach in plant biology. I also teach in genetics and genomics. So I'm a molecular biologist and, um, and still enjoy living in the UK. But what basically what this probably demonstrates you that doing a degree really allows you to broaden your horizon, allows you to travel. So I spent a year in the UK that completely changed my life. I was never thinking of even going to do a PhD in the UK, but the 10 months I had in Lancaster really opened the world for me. And so actually a degree and a study abroad program specifically can really, really help you find your way and, and set you off in directions that you might not think you would do, you know, just going to university or finishing your your uh, your high school studies. OK, uh, as I say, when I finished high school, my language skills were pretty dismal in English. German was much better. Obviously, my, my uh, native language and French was also completely rubbish, but I had to do both of them. And now I'm pretty fluent in English. So you see, I mean, you can do anything uh, if you just set your mind to it. OK, so that's my career. Um, pretty straightforward. So I've always had the sort of research path in mind. And so after my undergrad degree, I definitely wanted to do research, did the PhD, and I'm continuing this to this day. So primarily, I'm obviously a lecturer, but also I do a lot of research at the University of Essex. OK, <clears throat> and so let's delve into the topic. And I know plant science is not something students enjoy very much. OK, and I'm yet to figure out why that is the case. But plants are perceived to be a bit old fashioned, a bit boring. They don't really do anything. And, you know, obviously I disagree with that. And I disagree with that just for this one statement here that all life on, on Earth depends on plants. And all life on Earth that we know of depends on that little equation here, which hopefully you have heard about, which is photosynthesis, where molecules of carbons, molecules of water are fixed through the energy input from sunlight in plants to produce glucose, sugars, and to produce the oxygen we breathe. OK, so basically that's the output of photosynthesis. So we have low energy carbon in form of carbon dioxide, <coughs> excuse me, and we're producing a high energy reduced carbon in form of sugar. And as a byproduct, <coughs> we are releasing oxygen. So that is really important for our atmosphere. So just managing greenhouse gases, CO2 uptake is obviously really important, plants, but also in the oceans, algae that are doing a lot of photosynthesis. Um, this is the primary production and this is arguably, well, not even arguably, the most important chemical reaction on Earth. OK, without photosynthesis, life as we know it would not exist on this planet and would not be possible on this planet. OK. And so plants produce actually most of the oxygen we breathe. That alone obviously makes them worth being studied. They produce most of the chemically stored energy we consume as food and the fuel we burn. OK, so all of the fossil fuels were derived from photosynthesis from plants. And they also produce an amazing assortment of very useful chemicals. So a lot of drugs are basically plant derived. A lot of anti-cancer drugs are plant derived, highly toxic compounds. But they're actually really, really good chemical factories. OK, and understanding some of this is still actually pharmaceutical industry invests a lot of money trying to understand uh, how plants produce these compounds and how they probably can extract them and how they can utilize them in medicine, for instance. So that alone, I think, makes plants really important. And <clears throat> they're also really really well adapted to grow in very diverse environments. So you find, find plants on all continents of the earth from Antarctica, you know, to desert environments, to tropical. So these are pictures actually I took. So Colchester, temperate environment. This is Highwoods, um, you know, uh, Joshua Tree National Park and some, some tropical uh, regions. And we know that there's about 390,000 plant species that we know of. Actually, there's probably many more. Uh, and there's still many more that uh, need to be discovered, especially in tropical rainforests. Uh, and they're essential for human well-being, for food. That's the obvious one, medicine. As I say, there a lot of the medicines that we use today are derived from plants as a fuel and then obviously ornamental purposes. So no one is going to disagree that, you know, 
uh, bluebells in the forest are, you know, aesthetically quite pleasing, as are palm trees in the tropics. Okay. Okay, and so I'm going to focus on plants as an essential source of food. Okay, so obviously uh, we all consume plants in one way or another. And even if you say, well, actually, I only eat meat, that meat will at some point have consumed plants in order to grow. So cows eat plants, you, you know, uh, chickens obviously eat plant based diets. So a lot of the meat that you consume will have also be derived from plants just indirectly. Uh, for humans, we have about 30,000 edible plant species, but if only people only rely on just about 30 species in their diet. Okay, and here are some uh, species that you may recognize. These are different bean varieties. Here we have different pea varieties, wheat and barley. And so the genetic diversity in our crop plants is quite, quite big. If you can, if you look at this, we have about 40,000 different bean varieties and 30,000 different wheat varieties. So wheat produces the flour for pasta and bread. Um, and so there's quite a lot of diversity in those crop plants. So although we have 30,000 plant species that we could eat, we only use 30 plants predominantly. And then within those 30 plant species, we have great many varieties um, that are adapted for many different things, taste, uh, color, uh, where it grows and so on. And that genetic, genetic diversity is really, really important. And hopefully you'll uh, understand why that is important later. OK, just to go back now in time. So uh, originally humans were obviously hunter gatherers. And then after the last ice, ice age, uh, they decided they to have a more settled lifestyle. And they basically began the early forms of agriculture about 10,000 years ago. And so they started growing plants and to harvest plants and so basically settle in, in settlements and not move around with the food, food source anymore. And so about 10,000 years ago, humans started changing plants. OK, and the way this works is we have this variation, no plant species, no plant individual is the same to the next one. Obviously, the, the human population, we all have we all have the same genes, but no two humans are alike unless you have an identical twin. The same for plants. We have variation in a population. And so humans decided they are selecting for this variation. So early on, basically, humans decided we're going to always select for the biggest plant. And this, this is a maize plant. So you always select for the biggest seed uh, cop here, the, the head of the maize plant, and then plant the seed from this plant in the next generation in the hope that you represent bigger uh, maize plants in the next generation and so on. And so that happened 10,000 years ago and continues to happen to this day, actually. And just to illustrate what happens when humans are doing this, and this is basically just focusing on bigger cor corn sizes in maize, 7,000 years ago, 500 years ago. So this is a valley in Mexico where they did an archaeological dig and found these different cobs from basically maize. And you can see just by selecting every generation, slightly bigger plant and growing the next generation, they are managed in, in the space of six and a half thousand years to go from this size to, to this size. OK, granted, six and a half thousand years isn't particularly a fast process, but it's way faster than evolution. And so this is what we call artificial selection. OK, and so if you look at the wild ancestor of maize, OK, and people try to find the wild ancestor, and it's something called here that still grows in Mexico, actually. It's called teosinte. And initially, people thought, nah, this isn't related to corn. But you can see, uh, you know, has similar sort of leaf structure. But this is what the seed head looks like of teosinte. And this is what humans have done through this, you know, artificial selection, uh, basically changed this to this. And we have less branches, less leaves. And so basically, we genetically modified or modified the original ancestor of maize to look uh, now in the modern variety like this. OK, so you could argue here, you know, what is natural food? This is already a substantial genetic modification because whatever you've done here, you have altered the genes to change this plant into this plant. OK. Right, now artificial selection, as I think probably um, the best example and probably one everyone can relate to. We're looking at dog breeds, okay? So we introduce a genetic bottleneck. So if you think that dogs derived from wolves 
And we now have varieties of dogs in all shapes and sizes and forms from little chihuahuas to Great Danes to, you know, whatever takes your fancy. You can now have, you know, hundreds and hundreds of dog breeds. And you probably all also are all aware that some of these have genetic bottlenecks. So you'd struggle to go from a chihuahua to go back to a wolf because with this round of artificial selection, you obviously remove traits that you didn't like. Obviously, you didn't like the aggressiveness in, in wolves. Chihuahuas are obviously quite small, so you're reducing the size. So you're basically altering the genetic makeup without necessarily knowing what the genes are, but you're just selecting based on, on looks. And that has basically introduced a genetic bottleneck. And we also know that many of the dog breeds now have real problems with regards to, you know, obviously they don't get as old as mixed breed dogs and they may have, you know, hip problems. The skull might be too small. There's all sorts of problems with this pure breed dog varieties. And so this is what humans do. We artificial select. We've done that to dogs. We've done this to other animals. We've done this to plants. Okay. And so that's what we now have. We have a lot of highly inbred uh, plant species that we grow in modern agriculture. And we were typically breeding them for high yield under optimal growth conditions. And we've lost a lot of the genetic variability for other important traits because we were just looking for yield. We weren't, we weren't looking for anything else. And modern agriculture, again, these are some fields in Colchester, looks pretty much like this. You have large areas with a single type of crop basically monoculture. Uh, this is wheat, this is maize. Um, and obviously that's easy for the farmer. They can plant it very easily. They can look after it very easily. They know what it needs in that large area in terms of fertilizers and whatever in, you need to put into the field. But because we have monoculture, um, we may have lack of resilience against diseases. Uh, you know, plants succumb to diseases as well. And other types of stresses such as, you know, drought, so high temperature, or at the moment everything is flooded in the fields, plants were not really selected for these types of uh, problems. So obviously the questions we usually ask is what are those important traits that were lost? Like with dog breeds, what are the traits we've lost from a wolf in all the different dog breeds? What are the important traits that we lost in plants when we bred them? And Obviously, we now have to have the challenge here that we have uh, an increased food demand. The global population is on the rise. We need 50% more food from about the same land available. Okay, we're now well over 7 billion and we're projected to be 9 billion by 2030, 40. And we also need to increase the amount of people we can feed per hectare land. So obviously, we, we don't have much more land uh, available to, to grow crops but we need to basically feed a, a larger population. So we need to increase the output uh, basically per hectare. Okay, so that's the challenge. And that's in the backdrop of now unpredicted effects of climate change. So the crop species we have at the moment, obviously we, we selected them for yield and they work very well for yield, but they are not selected for this unpredicted effects of climate change. And this is now something that is a real challenge for plant scientists all over the world, actually. Because we now can see, starting to see the effects of climate change. And this is basically a study where they looked at extreme weather events across the globe um, and then came up with predictions whether some of these scenarios are more likely to occur in the future or less likely to occur in the future. And what you can see is that we are predicting to have more extreme weather events and they're most likely to be heat events, 43% more heat events and 18% more drought events. And drought events look at the worst case scenarios like this. This is a run dry riverbed. Um, this was actually in Colchester in 2020. You can see here how cracked the soils are and you know plants need water to grow. And South Africa the same, they declared drought actually as a national disaster, as a natural disaster and a national disaster where they had crop failures now for, you know, three, four years in a row. And so obviously when crops fails, that increases food prices and that has a lot of other effect, economic effects um, that are obviously quite uh, challenging to, to economies and whole countries and to the whole world, basically. So that's why we now need to think about 
climate change and what type of crops do we need? And so there's many variables to consider. OK, so this is just a schematic. So this is what we bred for. We usually checked and we picked the lines that has the highest yield under good field conditions, you know, nice weather, good water, decent amount of sunshine and all as well. OK, but then now we have more drought. We may have more cold. And actually, line B is the one that we've selected all these years and we're growing every year, year on year. And all of a sudden we have a dry year and line B is basically really poor in those conditions. And so basically this is not a good line if you're now expecting higher temperatures and drier uh, summers. So you need to now and go and find a line that might be good and under those conditions. And in this case, line A is actually quite doing really well, although under your normal conditions is an average plant. OK, but this average plant all of a sudden does better under drought conditions and is also OK under cold conditions. So basically what works under one condition may be bad under another condition. OK, and now this is now something that is really at the forefront of, of many plant scientists uh, the world over and also of plant breeders, farmers, every, everyone to do uh, with growing our food, basically. And so what we've done with this artificial selection and breeding, just like we have done with dogs, we've decreased the genetic diversity of our modern cultivars. We made the gene pool smaller, okay? And this, if you're going back, we can still find the wild grasses and the wild relatives of maize, the wild relatives of wheat and barley. We can still find all of these in, 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 in the wild out there. So we can go back to some of these older varieties and the wild populations with which are much larger gene pool. Okay, and so while we have lost in the modern cultivated varieties, we have very narrow gene pool. We, we can have a look in more older varieties and wild varieties of our crop plants. And basically what we need to look for is the right gene for the right environment and the right germplasm, as they're called. So the right variety for the right environment. And this is what plant science is partly about. OK. And so that's why genetic diversity is very important. And so, you know, I always make the plea to my first is it's really important to conserve plant genetic diversity. It's, all, it's very important to conserve your animal genetic diversity. You know, everyone cares about elephants are being endangered, rhinos are being endangered, but no one really cares about some of our plant genetic diversity being endangered. And if we are losing this genetic diversity, then we are in real trouble, okay? Because if we don't have genetic diversity in populations, if we don't have the right genes in populations, we will never get them back, okay? And then these plants will be lost uh, under climate change and we will not be able to grow them. And we may actually lose some of our plants. A good example might be here is the banana that is under threat from uh, quite a lot of pathogens at the moment. And I'll show you an example in a minute. And actually there's very little genetic diversity in banana populations. And so, you know, they're actually at a real threat of extinctions, bananas. So then if you don't have genetic Diversity, the only way to do get new genes into a population is by genetic modification through genetic engineering. OK, and this is also something we do at Essex. So you basically take a gene that you find interesting from one source, isolate it, recombine it and introduce it into the plant that you want to improve. And then once the gene is introduced into this plant, it functions just like any other genes. So again, Many of you may have heard about genetic modification of plants, and this is basically when we do it, when we don't have any natural genetic diversity, you then take gene from one organism and put it into plant species to enhance genetic diversity. And where this has happened is actually in the banana. I've just mentioned the banana is actually genetically very undiverse, so we have very few genotypes um, and it is uh, under threat from this particular disease is called banana bacterial wilt disease. You can see when it affects bananas, it is really devastating. So you don't get any fruit from this and it is kills 100% of the time. And we don't actually have any diversity in banana populations that has resistance. So there's no existing banana strain in the world that carries natural resistance to this pathogen. Okay, so even if you wanted to go back and try and crossbreed, you can't. So what people have done, pepper, 
is resistant to this particular ba bacterium, it's called Xanthomonas. So they've taken that gene from pepper, cut it out, recombined it into banana, okay? And this is now the transgenic banana infected with this particular pathogen. And you can see quite a stark difference. This is resistant now. This is susceptible. And this is a genetically modified banana. So with recombinant DNA te technology, um, and this is the only way that you could have introduced this particular resistance into the banana population. So there's a number of plant species where GM will be the only option because we have lost that genetic diversity. And so conserving plant genetic diversity is really important uh, for future, for the future existence of humankind, actually. I cannot stress this enough. <clears throat> so just to say, how do we get foreign genes into plants, of course. So how do we do this? How do I do this on a daily basis? And actually, I do actually transform plants almost on a daily basis for research purposes, not for consumption. And for that, we actually use a natural occurring bacterium. OK, and you find that in the UK as well. It's a soil bacterium. It's called Acrobacterium. And it, it infects plants in, the, in nature. And it infects plants on sites where the plant has been wounded. So you nick the, the bark, and then Acrobacterium can get in. And when it infects plants, it, it makes these tumors. It's called crown gall disease, uh, crown gall tumors. Um, if you go on a nature walk if, if, through a water or so, have a, have a look. You'll actually find these tumors quite regularly in nature. And Acrobacterium infects on these sites. You know it lives in these tumors. And it forms, the plant forms this tumor because Acrobacterium inserts a tiny little piece of DNA into the plant genome, okay? So this plant actually is in nature genetically modified by this bacterium, okay? So acro does this in nature anyway, okay? And the way it does this, so this is not to scale, this is the bacterium and this is a plant cell. Again, yeah, you know, missing out many different uh, components of the plant cell, but the important bit here is the bacterium carries some, a little piece of circular DNA it's called a tumor-inducing plasmid, but it's a round piece of DNA. And on this DNA, it has a piece of DNA called tDNA or transfer DNA. Okay, so this is the bit that gets taken from the bacterium into the plant cell. It gets integrated into the nuclear genome. And then uh, once it's integrated into the plant genome, it produces compounds such as uh, two hormones here that lead to tumor growth. And it also produces some compounds called opines, which are then transferred back into the bacterium. And this bacterium basically uses this as a food source. So the whole point for, of agro to transform a plant in the wild is for the plant to make it food for the bacterium. Okay? Plants not normally don't produce opines and they don't metabolize opines. So all of this is going back to the bacterium and then the bacterium uses this to metabolizes it, to produce energy and to live of it. And then basically happy, <clears throat> lives happily ever after in, in those tumors, <clears throat> excuse me. So this is happening in nature, okay? So you'll find genetically modified plants in nature. So obviously plant scientists at some point discovered, oh, this is what agrobacterium does, okay? It takes a piece of DNA from itself and transfers it into plants and puts it into the genome. And then this plant is basically transgenic. So once we discovered that, um, they're basically uh, plant scientists now utilize the system, okay? We're using agrobacterium. We're using this little piece of DNA in agrobacterium uh, and we are changing the tDNA, we're removing all the genes that make the tumor, that make the food. We don't want to feed the bacterium. We don't want the plant to have a tumor. So we remove all, the, all of those genes. We introduce the gene of interest, the one we want to put into the plant. For instance, the bacterial world resistance gene in banana. So we can put that onto the tDNA and then put it back into agrobacterium. And then the bacterium will transfer any gene that we put onto this tDNA into the plant genome. So in essence, Acrobacterium does the job for us. All we have to do is prepare that specific tDNA with a gene that we're interested in to get into the plant. And then there's many, many different steps. So it's, you know, it takes quite a bit of work to do that, but in principle, it works really well. And so we can basically genetically modify plants using this bacterium with any gene that you would like to insert into a plant. 
So research at Essex, and particularly in, in my group, is, is basically to look at how some plants manage to grow under, under uh, different environmental conditions. So we're now looking at climate change scenarios. So how do plants manage to grow under high temperatures and also with less water available, which are the predictions uh, for most uh, of Northern Europe. And uh, I studied the responses to that. And then, you know, I asked the questions, what are the genes that allow plants to grow under extreme conditions? And then are these the genes I should take uh, and manipulate crop plants with in order to enhance their uh, performance under these extreme conditions. So basically make these crop plants climate change ready by uh, identifying the important genes that might help plants to survive those conditions. And so we look a lot of uh, our experiments usually look at water availability, so drought, temperature, heat stress, and we look how plants acclimate to these. So how do plants respond to changes in these environmental conditions? Their physiology, they can grow, you know, their morphology, they may make smaller leaves, they may make longer roots. So there's a lot of different changes that happen in response to uh, these changing environmental conditions. And so, you know, we want to know how do plants sense these changes? What are the responses they activate? what genes have important roles in this acclimation response, uh, and are these the genes that we should then focus on? And, you know, plants are quite, you know, they're tricky, okay? So they're rooted to one spot. So they experience changes in environment on a daily basis, okay? So they have daily fluctuations, seasonal fluctuations. They can cope with that very well, okay? So they are quite complicated creatures because they cannot avoid anything that basically comes at them. If these changes, daily fluctuations or seasonal fluctuations become very extreme, that then leads to stress. So plants also live very stressful life, you know, high light conditions, high temperatures. We had extremely dry and hot summer last summer. That is extremely bad for plants. So soil salinity, so we can have salt in the soil. So if you have flooding events, not very good for plants. They don't like soil. <clears throat> we can have air pollution. So there's many different things that all contribute to stress and that plants need to be able to respond to because they cannot avoid, they, ca they cannot move into a shadier spot. They cannot go into a room that is air conditioned. They have to set it out, basically. And so we, in my lab, studies these responses to learn how plants may respond to potentially future climate change scenarios. And obviously there are predictions uh, the way weather will be going. And so the main work I do is actually on drought, which is basically a term for a period of insufficient precipitation that results in plant water deficits. So, I mean, in a soil like this, nothing is going to grow. And this is actually the major global agricultural production problem all over the world. So it's not just in Europe or in the UK. Actually, UK isn't actually that drought prone, but it's becoming more drought prone, especially East Anglia. But also we have excess uh, water flooding. So at the moment, all the fields are flooded. So the way the weather is going to go in the UK is that we have more wetter, warmer winters, which isn't great for plants either because they don't like sitting in standing water that then go to hotter and drier summers. So that is quite a, a contrast that's quite challenging to achieve to find a plant that can cope with both of that. But so what we study is basically we give them the environmental change. So we usually we stress them, we do drought stress, and then we have a look what happens in response to that. And again, this is just to illustrate how complicated this can get. So normally we have a single change in the environment, drought, for instance, and then so we get some morphological changes and the plant will sense there's less water in the soil and then we'll start inducing some signals. And usually it changes some regulatory proteins. So proteins that then will change changes in gene expression. So looking at RNA, uh, changes in proteins. So there's many things that then happen in response to a single environmental change that is amplified at each step in the cell to lead to this range of changes in proteins that are being made uh, or being downregulated. So uh, it's quite complicated. Um, we're beginning to understand this, and again, there's a whole international community that works on just environmental stress signaling what are the responses at the molecular level, and then can we learn from these 
to manipulate um, you know, our plants to be more resilient to some of these environmental changes. And I'm going to give you an example of how we go about this. So as a rule, <clears throat> so we, we're doing all of these molecular uh, you know, studies. So we're subjecting a model plant. This is the model plant here, Arabidopsis, to stress. Then we tend to do some DNA and RNA extractions and identify what uh, changes in response to that stress. And then we find these regulatory genes that then, again, downstream have an effect on, on large uh, number of proteins downstream. Okay, so we identify these key regulatory genes and then we usually do a genetic modification approach, introduce it into the model, have a look what, how does the model respond under those conditions? Is it improved? Is it doing worse? If it is a good positive outcome, we might then take that gene and put it into a related crop species and try this in the field. And this is an example from work in my lab. We've uh, used GM to enhance the levels of one of those regulatory proteins. It is called a heat shock transcription factor. Okay, and so it is in the name. So it's, this is a transcription factor that's regulating a heat shock response, so high temperatures. Humans have heat shock transcription factors too. Humans have three heat shock transcription factors in their genome. Okay, so when it's getting hot for us and we need to uh, have some responses to heat stress, we have those three transcription factors that regulate this. Plants have 21. Okay, so this particular plant species has 21 of those transcription factors. So that tells you how complicated plants are. And that's partly because they're rooted to a spot and they have to be able to really fine tune their responses to environmental changes. So we focused on one of those 23 or 21, sorry. I cloned this into the tDNA, okay, so and then put it into the model species and then asked, do we get increased heat tolerance? Do we get increased drought tolerance in that particular plant? And as you can see here, this is the genetically modified plant that now has the this particular gene, more copies of this particular gene. And this is the wild type, the non-GM plant. And this is grown under water limiting and high temperature conditions. And you can see here, this model plant is doing much better compared to the non-GM plant. Okay, so obviously this model plant, no one wants to eat. But we do a lot of our fundamental research and proof of concept studies in this model plant because it's quite easy to grow. Uh, but it's also relative to a number of our crop species. It's part of the mustard family and it is closely related to this particular crop here. Oilseed rape, rapeseed, brassica napus, the Latin name. And so what we've done, what I did then is take that same gene, transferred it via Acrobacterium into this oilseed rape plant and um, then obviously went into the field here and basically could show that these plants also perform better uh, in terms of growth in the field under drought conditions, also under high temperature conditions. And I have to give a disclaimer here. In the UK, you cannot grow GM crops in the field unless you have a permit. <clears throat> okay, so this was done in, in, in the United States in collaboration with the University of Illinois. So I have collaborators there. Uh, I flew out there to do the field trial. So again, telling you how international collaborative science is, you have a lot of opportunities to go and work abroad. And so they basically took some of our transgenic plants, put them in the field here. Some of the plots were watered, you can see here, some were left uh, without water. And the temperature in this particular field was 30 plus degrees for about four weeks. So they had high, high temperature, high drought conditions, some of the plots, and uh, they were performing much better under those conditions. Um, yeah, so that's at the moment not published. Uh, so that's the type of work we do in the School of Life Science. And um, so just to give you a little bit of an overview, obviously I'm also an academic. Uh, we are a very research intensive university, as you probably can tell now. It's very interdisciplinary. So I'm a plant biologist. If, I don't know if you've been to any of the other talks. So you had to talk about cancer biology. You had to talk about how to become biomedical scientists. So we have research in all those areas. And so we have degrees in all those areas. So we have six biological science, uh, BSc degrees, also master courses, but we also have a lot of research students. So 100 PhD students, 
overall is about a thousand students. And um, so our, our teaching is very much a research led teaching. And especially in the final year, uh, you will get a lot of uh, research within your teaching. Okay. And so that interdisciplinary aspect of the department is shown in the breadth of the degree courses we offer and modules you can take biotechnology, ecology, cancer biology, molecular and cell biology. Um, so, and we have modern facilities to basically do lab and field skills in, in all of those um, areas, because obviously we have active research labs. And so then one big aspect of your degree would be to be part of this research and you do your independent research projects. And you can see here plant biotechnology is only one of the topics, but we also have field ecology, cancer biology, immunology, biochemistry, protein dynamics. So there's a whole raft of subjects you can study, not just plant biology, but I'm hoping that at least for some of you, I mean, it's only two of you, I have, I have convinced you that actually studying plant biology is really important. It is actually one of the fundamental uh, requirements for human survival on this earth, that we are going to be able to grow sufficient food, to have plants be able to grow sufficient food uh, for, for future climate change scenarios and for this increase in population. And with this, uh, I stop here now. Please do get in touch. Obviously, if you have questions about the talk, get in touch with me. This is my email. If you have questions about our degrees, get in touch as well. I'm the director of admissions. Um, I would like to thank you. And then just one thing here at the end, if you are interested in about GM and modified foods, foods. I know it is a you know a controversial topic and there's pros and cons. Um, there is some quite easily readable reports with regards to GM and future for, for um, agriculture and whether it's part or not part of, of increasing uh, our, our global agricultural out, uh, output. Uh, so they're quite interesting to read just in case you're interested. Okay, and with that, I now stop. Okay, okay. So I'm, I'm happy, obviously, to answer questions. Let me just try yeah, and yeah. share my screen. How does that work now? Okay, so if you have any questions, you feel free to unmute um, so you can mute yourself. Julie from the school, life sciences, also Katie from the outreach team at Essex. Anyone got a question? Want to ask me to share? I'll put it in the chat. I mean, I've got a general question I can ask to sort of, mm -hmm. uh, so one or both of you can ask this. You mentioned at yeah. the beginning, Julie, really, about your sort of, you know, the experience you had by coming over to Lancaster University and the mm -hmm. place for years. I mean, what's the, you know, something I speak to a lot of students about in terms of, you know, getting value out of their degree, whatever it is, and asking these questions at open days, or suppose now virtual open days. I mean, what's the sort of um, placement options or kind of study abroad options with this course linked to Essex at the moment? Oh, yeah, we have, we have four year variants for all our degrees so you can go on the year abroad uh, and also have a year in industry if you want okay and they're quite competitive so it's you know you can enroll on it uh, and you can apply for it but whether you secure a place partly depends on how well you're doing your first year so they're actually quite competitive and I was the study abroad officer for Essex as well and so we, we send you know we did send up to 15 to 20 percent of our students abroad a um, few years back, obviously now we have a bit of an issue with the pandemic on our hands, but uh, and that tend to go to Australia, New Zealand, America, Canada. Our students tend to go to English speaking countries or English teaching countries because if you do science, you're not necessarily the linguist, as I said, you know, I wasn't a linguist. And so we have a lot of European partners, but then you would have to be you, you normally taught in the European language and that is a challenge. So I have had a couple of students going to Germany, sitting in lectures in German and sitting exams in German. And that, you know, they had done A-level German, but they came back and said that was hard. OK, so I would always strongly discourage, unless you're really proficient in a language, going to study a science in another language is tough. So but we have plenty of English speaking placements, even now in the e European Union. So Holland, Sweden, Finland, they're all teaching English now pretty much. Um, so there's plenty of options and it is a life-changing experience. It was for me 
and all the students that come back from the year abroad, I mean, I do speak to them afterwards. They say it was the best thing they've ever done in their life, up to that point, obviously. So definitely there are many options. And the same with placement, which is different because you're then doing a year research somewhere in a company. Um, so you're almost getting the feel for your know, work because it's basically a nine to five job mostly. You're assigned to a project and you basically spend a year uh, going to that company. So we have, I don't know, partners like AstraZeneca. We have people work for Sainsbury's in the sort of data science section of Sainsbury's. Um, uh, people working for, I don't yeah, I can't remember now, many, many, many different companies. Uh, but they're going, again, they're quite competitive because you're applying, you're competing with the whole of the UK for placements, basically. But we help with applications CVs, we give mock interviews, so we'll try our utmost to prepare the students for going on placement and securing a placement. Yeah. Okay, we have a question actually from Wendy mm -hmm. here. Um, I'm not sure there's a typo here, but it says, how has COVID affected the you put resource, but I think you mean resource, no? Uh, do you want to maybe retype that, Wendy, or? Um, Resource, what resource yeah, are we talking yeah, about? Yeah. What do you mean by resource? Yeah. Feel so free to unmute yourself if you want, Wendy. Yeah. I mean, obviously, uh, this year, the COVID has affected our course, our teaching quite a bit, for sure. Um, but I don't know whether that's what you're asking. Yeah, she's just typing here. Yeah. Um, okay. Oh, nothing. No, she's typing, it's now gone. So I oh, know that's she's typing she's, again, yeah. Okay. It's probably internet connection, maybe a bit. Yeah. Oh, sorry. <laughs> so how's COVID affected the traveling and? Yeah, that yeah has. Um, yeah, don't worry about that. Um, it has affected traveling. I mean, you know, normally we go if you're if you're doing research you're going to two or three conferences a year so the year before covid i was uh, in the us i was in finland i was in uh, in spain and you know um so i traveled pretty much all over the world for work um and that has completely not happened like this year in 2020 right um so everything has moved online um and so field trials haven't happened um, so a lot, I mean, even our lab work had to stop because obviously, you know, the uni shut down um, and now we have a basic lab rotor again. So some of my people are back in the lab, but everything has to happen as social distancing at the moment. So in terms of research and work, everything has slowed down massively, which is a shame. Um, but on the other hand, it's also, it was also quite nice to just spend a year at home. Because we're, we're traveling, I mean, as I say, as scientists, you tend to travel a lot. I mean, outside term, obviously. During term, we're obviously teaching, but then come, you know, teaching free periods, we're basically on the road an awful lot, which is good fun, but can be very tiring. And so it gave us a chance to maybe, you know, take a step back and take a breath and relax a bit. But I think we're all kind of itching to go back and do field trials in the US and, and, and you know, get out there network with your colleagues. Part of the conference, conferences and traveling is to meet with your colleagues, you know, do strike up collaborations, 
do projects together. So it's a very collaborative and 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 fun environment science, not just plant science, any science. Um, and so it, it does give you a lot of opportunities for travel and international collect connections. And that hopefully, fingers crossed, will pick up in 2022. At the moment, I can, you know, all the conferences again are online. So the one that was meant to be in Prague is going to be online. Uh, so everything is still pretty much online this year because people just don't know whether you can travel or not. So unfortunately, it has impacted us a lot, but, you know, there is a small price to pay, I think. OK, any last questions? And obviously we still got Katie here from the outreach team. Yeah can answer sort of general questions about studying or accommodation, I suppose, or any kind of general inquiries. OK, well, we're at our, we've reached four o'clock, so we've done well. OK, so we'll leave it there. And thanks, Yuli and Katie. OK, thank you very much. So, thank you. OK, all right. Thank okay. you. Thank yeah. you. Bye. Bye. Bye.